my whole life changed in that moment. And Bowie did that for me. Whenever I felt lost or broken, Bowie put me back together. And I found that really insulting that I... I was being judged purely on being attractive and not really as an up-and-coming artist. Mm. Virgin Radio, 80s Plus. We're going to start off with your first track, Bowie, Ashes to Ashes. Is this your favourite Bowie song? Why have you picked it? It's a very powerful Bowie song for me. Bowie always punctuated the points in my life where I felt the carpet had been pulled from under my feet. Right. The first time I heard Life on Mars, for instance, I was doing an audition with Phil Daniels for a play on BBC Two. Mm -hmm. And I sang Life on Mars at my first audition and got the part. Wow. Now with Ashes to Ashes I was already becoming a, a very cult famous figure within the punk movement 1980. Yes. And I remember going away to write songs with my writing partner at that time Joel Bogan and we were we were just a bit lost. We'd been signed to a record label. We hadn't quite got the full band together. And Ashes to Ashes came on the radio and we were in a, a cottage somewhere in Dorset writing. And it was, my whole life changed in that moment. And Bowie did that for me. Whenever I felt lost or broken, Bowie put me back together. And Ashes to Ashes is one of those songs. I must ask you, I've always wanted to ask you about Derek Jarman. Yes. Okay, so please tell me, I heard that he kind of spotted you and as far as the movie Jubilee goes, which I've seen, it blew my teenage mind. Yes. But he said to you, I want you in this movie and I don't care who you play or whatever, I want you in here. Tell me how you met him, how that started. The actor Ian Charleston, Chariots of Fire, we were both working at the National Theatre and Ian said to me, you've got to come and meet this director called Derek Jarman. He's making a movie about the punk movement and the royal family because I think the original name of the, the movie was going to be Down With The Queen um, and it became Jubilee. But Derek and I and Ian had tea at his apartment, Tree Gunter Road, and Derek's way of casting a movie was just extraordinary. He said, look at the script, pick your role. Wow. But you can't play Amel Nitrate, that's Jordan. And Jordan is the, this icon iconic punk queen. Yes. And I picked Mad. I literally flicked through the script and went for the part with the most lines and picked Mad. But then a few weeks later, Derek had to say to me that his budget had been cut and he had to cut down the whole film to four characters. I, he instinctively realised that I was heartbroken that Mad was going to be cut from the script. And then a week later, Derek phoned and he said, I've given up my fee so that you can be in the film. Oh, wow. And he put Mad back in. Yeah. Now, that is exactly who and what Derek was. Derek put people in a room and said, do whatever you want. So if you can imagine, literally where this building is that you and I are talking in now yeah. was one of the sets. It wow. was an old warehouse. Yes. John Mapry doing the sets. Kenny, the drummer from Susie and the Banshee, painting the walls. You had Adamant, myself, Little Nell, Jenny Runacre. We were all together just making this film happen in this kind of family atmosphere with Derek Jarman giving us sandwiches to sustain <laughs> us. And it, it worked. And I actually believe that that film was 40 years too soon. Because now, in today's climate, and with today's revolution of language, of history, of addressing the equality of everyone, and the equality of choice within mm. everyone, Derek was there 42 years ago, behaving like that, living like that, and fighting for those rights. And this film, as mad as it is, I think belongs today. Yeah, amazing. And also, I mean, it's gone, these movies have gone down in cult status now, haven't they? Oh, people... It blew my teenage mind watching that. I wasn't sure what I was watching. Yes. But I loved it, and I'd never seen anything like it before. Nothing like it. Very collage, very free-thinking. As performers, we were all bouncing off the wall with our energy. And what I love today is so many young kids, and I'm talking about 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds coming up to me saying, we're studying. Derek Jarman. Amazing. We want to make movies like Derek. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What should we pick next? Should we go for, what would you like you pick? I think Kate Bush, because Kate 
quite rightly, her catalogue from 1985, which is Hounds of Love, yeah. uh, is just... I mean, it's announced today that she's getting songwriting nominations as a contemporary artist. For the Ivan Novello. For the Ivan Novello. Amazing, isn't it? And, I mean, it, it was absolutely amazing when The Hounds of Love came out. Yeah. It, it was groundbreaking. It lifted Kate from that the artists that everyone felt they knew with Babushka and and um, Wuthering Heights, it lifted her into the stratosphere of A-list writers, even in 1985. But to have it come back the way it has, and she's discovered now by a completely new audience, I think is the most perfect trajectory for a career anyone could have. What do you think about the whole um, situation with a movie or, a, you know, like a TV TV show picking up on a song from years ago, using it, and suddenly I, it's huge I again. personally would say the record industry as it is today, where we are reliant on download sales, but that doesn't necessarily pay our way. Yeah. Uh, we're all completely reliant on what's called syncs, and that is your back catalogue being discovered, or even your present catalogue mm -hmm. being placed in a movie, an advert, or, or a TV series. We're totally reliant on it. But I feel really, really optimistic that it opens up the world of music, every genre, every time frame, 80s, 70s, 60s, 90s, 2000. I mean, it's all possible now. Yeah, and yeah. it's all happening. Did you know Kate? Do you know her? Yes. Have your paths crossed? Can you tell me something about her? Well, um, when Kate had Bertie and the world didn't know about her son, yeah. Kate would come to our house. Uh, I live on the River Avon and my father would take them out on his boat and they had privacy and could play. So we know the private Kate. What's she like? She's an absolute... Is she otherworldly? She's incredibly bright and intelligent. Um, otherworldly, possibly, yes, but just a really beautiful human being, kind, and loves other people. She loves interesting people she's always interested in what you're doing what you're up to always wants a lovely conversation kate never sits down and talks about kate kate sits down and talks about you uh, very like derek charman just a really lovely soul who just wants to be plugged into creativity amazing amazing how do you think she feels now after the year that she's had She's thrilled. Yeah, you know, have you uh, yeah. spoken to her? About well, we got an email at Christmas and, and she said, my goodness, you wouldn't believe what's going on. Um, Kate's very private and she loves the silence of her home life. Mm. Uh, she makes jam, she makes cakes, uh, loves being involved with Bertie's social circle. Uh, I think it amazes her as someone who tries to stay out of the limelight that she's increasingly being thrown back into it. <laughs> and the most amazing conversation I had with her uh, was backstage from before the dawn and in 2013. And she'd just been invited to take the show to Broadway. Uh, and she said, I just look forward to going home. Wow. You know, I love that. So you probably, I, I think you've answered my next question. Would she go out on tour again off the back of I, this I'm success? I'm not answering that for her. That, that's her right. Do you right. think she might do a couple of shows? No. But, um, you know, that is, that's her life yeah, to talk no, about. Absolutely. But what I will say is the most talented people in the world, and I've worked with a lot of them, yeah. don't actually, they're not actually terribly ambitious um, my husband, Robert Fripp, he, he's the most private, home-based person I know. Uh, and Kate is very similar. Her values are with love and family, uh, as well as creativity. And we're going to go into your song, Hounds of Love, now. Just give me a line on this song of what it means to when you. When I first ha heard Hounds of Love, I was on a plane going to meet my husband, and he was about to propose to me. And I, I was very vulnerable. I was in tears. I was leaving my old life to go to America. So Hounds of Love to me is about the life I was about to enter into. Very broken time for me. Uh, I was leaving an old life to start a new life. What's the next song we're going to go for? Well, I, it's very 
linked to Kate Bush in many ways. It, it's Peter Gabriel. Right. Uh, and But I'm going for Sledgehammer because his management called me in, Hit and Run called me in um, to listen to his album. And I just was blown away and very flattered that they wanted my opinion on it. And they played me Sledgehammer and I thought, this is fantastic. I have loved Peter Gabriel since he went solo. And of course, my husband produced him as a solo artist. Yes. Uh, and played on The Flood, I believe. So the links are all there. And my husband was in the studio when Peter and Kate did Don't Give Up. Oh, amazing. And Peter did about 73 takes, I've been led to believe, and Kate got it right on the first take. And my husband was in the <laughs> studio and he was sitting there thinking, she's got it right. Just stop doing takes. She's got it oh, right wow. on the first take. The pressure. So... I want to play Peter Gabriel because, for me, he inspires me. If ever I need to just open my mind up and feel really creative, it's Sledgehammer. It's, it's Us, the album. Everything he does informs me of what I would like to do. Can you remember hearing this track for the very first time? Because obviously now it's gone down in legendary yes. status. So you hear it again and again, but it, how did you? How did it make you feel? I was in the Hit and Run offices on Walton Street in Knightsbridge when the management played it to me. And the first time I heard it, I felt complete envy because this is such a complete song. The production, the vocal, the arrangement is so wonderful. And I envy anyone who has that time and that focus to do it, because Peter can scrap whole albums and start again. Really? But when he gets it right, my goodness, it's there for eternity. But I then went to Switzerland to film a TV programme with Nicholas Lindhurst. And I was in the Alps in the snow, uh, sitting on a balcony, just looking out over the mountains. And it was on loop on my Walkman. Yeah. And I came away from that experience just an hour listening to Sledgehammer. I wrote an album called Ophelia's Shadow, which was critically acclaimed in America. And it's nothing to do with Sledgehammer, but the whole experience of Peter's voice, his choices of how he sings words, like Bowie, mm -hmm. how he'll deliver a line, his timing, just un unlocked me creatively. And I just sat there, just writing nonstop. My husband watches me do this when we watch TV. Yeah. When I see um, Klaus Bang, the actor in a, a film or a, a drama, they unlock me and I keep pen and pad next to me and my hand is just writing, 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 writing. And my husband says, how are you doing that? You're not even looking at the paper. And I just think certain people, are they open a creative pathway and I never let those moments go. And I can come away with 10 pages of ideas. And of course, we do need to quickly chat about the video to this track because it really is even now something special, isn't it? Absolutely I mean, you know, he apparently sat under a, sh a sheet of glass for 16 hours yeah. in the knowledge that nobody would do that and ever come close to doing At it. At a time when stop frame technology was the only way to do it. There was no CGI at this time. There was uh, no other way of doing it than animation and this is live animation yeah and i just think he knew he was onto a good thing he trusted the filmmakers mm -hmm. but this is what's so beautiful about peter's career is that he will go off on really strange tangents that bring something back into the zeitgeist and he creates zeitgeist mm -hmm. and that's why he's who he is brilliant which one are we going to go for next I would love to go for Mark Almond, Tainted Love. Oh, I love it. Tell me about this. Well, partly I'm touring all of this year with my husband, Robert Fripp. We've got Isle of Wight, yeah. uh, Crop Ready and many, many other festivals. Okay. And then we're touring in October in homage to our social media hit, Sunday Lunch. What happened there? Tell me about that, because that's exploded, hasn't it's it, exploded. recently? It's exploded. What happened? Uh, well... What we're doing for the tour is we'll have a big screen and the, the show will be have an image narration of looking back at the Sunday lunches. Uh, but basically, Robert and I all year are just doing an absolutely rocking 
um, tour. Yeah. At, we're going out and doing rock music. It's a live music show. Have you toured with him before? Uh, Have you been it, on the road with him before? Yes, with a band called Sunday All Over the World in 1988. Right. Right. Uh, but not since. But we love working together. So people will come up, they'll have a fantastic show. The show is 50% British writers, 50% English writers. Right. The 11 of my songs are in the show, but then we pepper the show with great rock. Okay. So we have Guns N' Roses, we have uh, uh, Mark Almond, which is why I want to play Tainted Love, yeah. because that's in our show. I, when I first heard this, and I cannot believe this came out as early as 1981. That's amazing, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it incredible? 81. The, the, 42, 43 years ago. When that intro begins, you just need that first duh, duh. And the audience just go crazy. Yeah. And I've seen this. I work with Mark, Mark Almond all the time at the Rewinds and the Let's Rocks. And you just get that first duh, duh. And the whole audience is just dancing and yeah. elated and I think that's the, the power of this production um, for Mark Almond and the video is sensational because it's the first time people wore this kind of lighting technology so you have two dancers come in through a window yes. and they've got a light suit on yeah. and then they're dancing while Mark is lying in bed or there's a model lying in bed That's right. and Mark is projected He's a very in. attractive young man if I may say so Oh he's gorgeous Isn't he? But the video is just perfection and I think this song is what the 80s is about. Yeah. And what was the thing? The album version is mixed into Where Do Our Hearts Go Now or something. Oh, is Have you it? Heard that? It's brilliant. I probably have heard it's it. It's so good. It's so, so good. And obviously this is a cover of a song by Gloria Jones, but yes. everybody remembers this version because it's so... This is the definitive and artists have done it very brilliantly ever since. But Mark is his delivery his vocal he's a torch singer it, you can feel his pain uh, in everything he does he delivers a very beautiful pain uh, um and I, I think it's quite important within popular music that we recognize broken hearts we recognize relationships that didn't last and all of that but he does it with such a joyful song Brilliant. That's a superb. Which one should we go for next on your list? We could do all of these, this list. Did it take you a long time to put this list together? No, it didn't take a long time to put the list together because I think the 80s has so much to offer. I just don't think it's going to go away. No. These are storytelling songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I chosen In Excess next, Need You Tonight. Just because In Excess by 1987 were able to strip the production back. Yeah. So that it was about rhythm. It was about hitting the beat. And you had this gorgeous, beautiful Adonis um, on lead vocals, Michael Hutchins. And there's such an innocence about what they do. And yet he cannot help exude extreme sexuality. What was it about him? Perfect body, perfect voice. Um, it, he was flirtatious with the microphone and the camera. Uh, and, of course, the the very famous story about Paula Yates at that time. Uh, and it was the love story that everyone was intrigued by. Was it at that time or had they not so the, met? The, 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 the love thing with her started on the Big Breakfast in the 90s. So this is going, if you kind of like 10 years later, yeah. they were then dating. He passed away in 97. I think he passed away before she did. But you know, I, I interviewed her just before she passed away. Right. Uh, and she was actually in, in a very good place. Um, uh, utterly beautiful. Just legendary beauty, uh, articulate, but she was in a good place. Right. And she arrived with her friend Belinda, who protected her mm -hmm. like a like a, a dragon, quite rightly. Um, and Paula was able to talk about everything. Yeah. Um, and I was super impressed and fell in love with her, like everyone did who met her. But I think something was going on with Michael Hutchins long before. It was public, which is why I picked up on it. Because they were very, very, instant. very flirty on that show, on The Big Breakfast, it was on, on the bed, wasn't it? I mean, like... It w I think Michael couldn't believe how forward she was. Yeah. But they were made for each other. You could see it. But I think he's a beautiful man and 
a, a fantastic band and I've always felt protective of him. Ever since at the Brits, he was presented with a prize and the person who presented it said, you're a has-been. And from that moment on, I would fight a battle for Michael Hutchins. I would fight to protect him because it, it was disgraceful that any uh, anyone, yet alone another artist, should abuse someone mm. in front of such a big world audience like that. Yeah. So I've always just felt really pr protective towards him. Mm -hmm. And what a loss. What a shame. A big loss. How sad that story. How that, I, you know, I watched the Paula documentary recently oh, on Channel 4. And, but it's great to hear what you said, because everybody said the same thing, that she was in a really good place. She was in a great place. place. And that death, if you want to call it accidental or whatever, it wasn't meant to happen. Uh, of course it wasn't meant to happen. Um, and looking back at Peaches, that wasn't meant to happen. The, this, the DNA in this family is absolutely brilliant. And what would Paula be doing now? She'd just be doing magnificent things. Uh, and she was in a great place at that time. Great stuff. OK, thank you very much. We've done the five, but let's pick another one because okay. I'm having a great time. I would love to pick Alice Cooper. What I really want to ask you, Toya, is you were there. It's amazing to be talking to somebody who was there. You were there in the punk scene. You remember it first time round. Do you think there's a chance that we could revisit anything like that? Do you think the punk scene might come back again, or is it being done and dusted? Oh, no, it's not done and dusted. Um, I, I do the Rebellion Festival, which is a punk festival, and that audience is all ages so obviously we original punks because i'm about to turn 65 we're of a certain age yeah but that audience is all age groups really i think what's beautiful about the punk philosophy is it policed itself in the beginning it needed to be policed there, there was sidetracking into kind of the wrong image was it really genuinely anarchic yes Absolutely. I was at the National Theatre when I was 18 and, and I think I outpunked the National Theatre <laughs> because I, I think I was the... I was the first punk there uh, and it did shock people even in an establishment like the National, yeah. which is a groundbreaking theatre. It, but what it did for me, I'm not a conventional physical type for a woman in music. Mm. I'm very, very small. I don't have beautiful long legs. Uh, I, I, I'm just powerful and I have a lot of energy and bravado and punk allowed me into the music industry mm. and people really resisted it people resisted signing me I probably was one of the last acts signed I got signed to the independent safari uh, about 1978 uh, and that was quite late to get signed mm. and my sheer will and bravado pushed me uh, into the kind of front runners as it were mm -hmm. and only last December, Anthem was re-released and, and charted again, went straight in at number 22. Yeah. So I think because I haven't had physical, physicality in my favour, um, I was, firstly, I was gender neutral at the, at the beginning of my career. I, I dressed gender neutral. Right. Because I thought there was absolutely no point trying to win people over by being feminine. It just wasn't going to work. Did that mean, in the sense now, that as kind of non-binary, non that you didn't identify as being a she? Or I how didn't did that want work? to be identified as a gender. Right. It was nothing to do with he or she. Yeah. I just felt that people were judging me uh, when they were writing about me as not attractive as a woman. Um, no one that they wanted to sleep with as a woman. Uh, and I found that really insulting, that I I was being judged purely on being attractive and not really as an up-and-coming artist. Mm -hmm. So I just started to not go that way. That's I amazing. just stayed... Did anyone ask any questions back then? Because it would seem that people were quite accepting, you do you. People were genuinely fascinated that I had the guts to kind of not play the game of of being the, the cute little woman mm. uh, because I, I was very aggressive in, in how I moved through my career. Uh, not violent, but strident. And uh, people were genuinely fascinated. Uh, my clothes designer wa was a woman called Melissa Kaplan who designed for um, Bananarama. Um, she designed for Adamant. 
uh, and many, many others, Steve Strange uh, and possibly Mark Almond at that time. And her remit was, I want to be gender neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a human being, not a gender. Tell me about Alice Cooper and why you want this song. School's Out. I love this song. And funnily enough, my husband loves this song. We covered it in our Sunday lunch social media. This is... Oh, no, it's Poison. Poison, Is yeah. that OK? Yeah, great. Po tell me why. Um... Our Sunday lunch, which we do every Sunday, my husband Robert Fripp and I... Just explain what that is, just in case people haven't seen it or don't know, what is Sunday lunch? It's on the Toya YouTube channel. Yes. And every Sunday at 12 noon, uh, we have a social media posting, 90 seconds, a performance from Toya and Robert. Yeah. And in the lockdown years, this was huge around the world. I bet. And it's still huge now. Is we, that when it started during the pandemic in the yes. lockdown? Yeah. We did it because we posted one film of us dancing April the 19th, I think it was, 2020, and we instantly got replies from around the world, uh, from New Zealand, from Bali, from Hong Kong. So we continued to do it every Sunday. And we've had 111 million visits. Wow, that's we're, impressive, isn't we're it? We're now having a documentary made about us, uh, which is filming for the next 12 months, following us on, on our tours. Uh, and you do this track, you do Poison, do you? We, we, on the tour, we're going to do Schools Out. But oh, okay. we did this track yeah. on Sunday lunch. And Alice Cooper was sent it. Yes. And he was played it live on his broadcast. Uh, his his band said, you need to see this. Yeah. And we were made to watch him watching it live. <laughs> and he was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> and I sent a message to him. I said, I'm really sorry about this, Alice, but you do not know what you mean to me as a teenager yeah. in the early 70s and today. You've proven to me that y you can just go through life being strong, doing what you believe in. What did he in. say back? He was so gracious. Is I mean, he lovely? He, he laughed his head off at the Sunday lunch because I was dressed as a nurse and I think <laughs> he was really embarrassed by it, but he was really lovely. An absolute pleasure. Toya Wilcox, uh, lots of love. Thank lots you. Lots of love and thank, see thank you on you. the road. See you there. Maybe at Glastonbury, maybe not. We don't know. It could happen. I'm getting a look. <laughs> <laughs>